Hello, my name is Melissa Monner, and I'm a patient advocate at Oregon Health and Science University. I also serve on the Clinical Ethics Consult Service, and am involved with the Center for Ethics at OHSU. I was invited by the Center for Ethics to share with you today my reflections on the COVID-19 pandemic impact on vulnerable populations. This is a loaded question. Some are vulnerable out of circumstances that none could control, but some are vulnerable due to systemic and insidious injustices that impact generation after generation. Of the many people particularly vulnerable during the pandemic, Native Americans, the poor, the homeless, the incarcerated, refugees, and the undocumented, the pandemic's impact on African Americans and on people with disabilities reveals truths that may enhance a general understanding of what all vulnerable populations may endure. It is these two groups that I will focus on today. I am here with you as a learner, not an expert, one who is trying to grapple with issues even more apparent under the spotlight of a global pandemic and as a human being asking herself, what does it mean to be a good neighbor in days such as these? Like most everyone, I share the vantage point of being personally impacted by the uncertainty of an economic downturn, of living on the edge of worry about the health and well-being of my community, and of wishing that I had known that the last hug with loved ones would be the very last hug for a long time. These experiences can be hard, but also valuable. Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, a compassionate and renowned bioethicist, said a pivotal experience in his own development as a physician and a philosopher was contracting tuberculosis during his residency. The son of Italian immigrants, he was initially refused entrance into an Ivy League medical school despite graduating summa cum laude from St. John's University with the explanation that he would be, quote, happier with his own kind, end quote. There is something to be said for how our own suffering can open us up to the suffering of others. COVID-19 can escalate anxiety in people who already have complicated relationships with healthcare. Several years ago into my work as a hospital-based patient advocate, I was paged by a physician who asked me to speak to a patient who was wanting to leave against medical advice. She explained that the patient had high blood pressure and needed to have kidney dialysis in order to help lower his blood pressure. Otherwise, she was very concerned that the patient was going to have a stroke. She said the first dialysis access was attempted in his arm, but when it failed, the medical team tried to place an emergency access in his neck. It was at that point that the patient refused and demanded to leave. The physician, having attempted to convince the patient to stay and feeling the pressure of the needs of her other patients, asked me to visit and try to talk the man into staying for his safety. I went into the patient's room with my mission in mind, but when I arrived, he was dressed in his street clothes, sitting on the edge of the bed. He had packed up all of his personal belongings, ex except for a large Bible sitting on his bedside tray. When I walked into the room, he handed me a torn piece of paper with a phone number. Call me a cab, he demanded. I could tell by his tone of voice and posture that there was no room for negotiation. I sat down in the chair across from him and asked as humbly as I could, if I promise not to talk you into anything, will you, get, will you tell me what happened? I think they are experimenting on me, he said directly, and again demanded the cab. I tried gently to ask him about people who were important to him and about his relationship with his primary care provider. Surprisingly, he engaged in conversation and expressed a deep trust in his PCP. Over time, I was able to ask what he thought about my helping him connect by phone to his PCP. 
for input into this situation. This eventually was arranged, and the patient, after talking to a medical professional he trusted, his PCP, arranged to take some oral medications while plans were made to transfer him to another hospital he, he trusted for dialysis. I was surprised at first to hear the patient's assumption of the medical team's intent, and then I thought back to the Tuskegee syphilis study in 1932, when 600 black men, thinking they were receiving medical care, were actually part of a research study conducted by the U.S. Public Health Service to record effects of untreated syphilis. While the original plan was to run the study for six months, it ran for 40 years. When penicillin was discovered as the treatment for syphilis in 1947, the medicine was never offered to these men, and the disease continued untreated for 40 years to observe the effects. In 1972, the truth ultimately revealed by the news media caused a public outrage. Many of the men in the study died from complications of the syphilis, and wives and children contracted the disease. Research suggests that the effects of the Tuskegee study and the lack of transparency extend beyond the participants to the greater whole of black culture. Black patients consistently express less trust in their physicians and the medical system than do white patients. They are more likely to believe medical conspiracies and less likely to have positive experiences in healthcare settings, leading to the erosion of trust and reduction in seeking health care, ultimately resulting in reduced life expectancy of black men. This disparity continues to be reflected in the data collected around COVID-19. The Chicago Tribune reported that black Chicagoans are dying from the coronavirus at a higher rate than any other racial demographic, a reflection of the consequences that disadvantaged communities have experienced for generations. About 68% of the city's deaths were of African Americans, who make up about 30% of Chicago's total population. Also disproportionately impacted by the pandemic are people with disabilities. Certain disabilities and chronic illnesses put this population at higher risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19. Social distancing can be harder, if not impossible, for those who live in group homes or a nursing facility. Healthcare providers are trained to focus on the best interest of the patient, but public health emergencies can shift the priority from the individual to the community in triaging allocation of limited resources, such as ventilators, personal protective equipment, and medical staff. Crisis care standards focused on saving the most lives or those who have the most years to live, can feel threatening to those whose medical condition correlates to a shorter life expectancy or, or who are medically at higher risk. Disability rights activist Ari Naaman cites three main ways impartial or non-discriminating medical judgment can put people who experience disabilities at a disadvantage. Resource intensity the amount of time and effort a patient will require to have a chance of surviving COVID-19. Secondly, long-term survival. Not only may this feel like ageism, but disadvantages those with conditions that translate to shorter life expectancy. And lastly, short-term survival and reasonable modifications, permanent or pre-existing, such as those for spinal cord injury or impaired speech or any accommodations needed during treatment toward recovery. Additionally, the bias of, of ableism, at times overtly and at times subtly, questions the quality of life of those people with disabilities, assuming that a, quote, good life is one without disability. I can relate to this bias of ableism in my own life. I used to ride the bus with a woman who experienced the disability of limited mobility and difficulty speaking. She used an electric wheelchair and could not reach the pole cord to request a stop. So instead, she yelled at the bus driver when her stop was near. I could not understand her. 
I was intimidated, and in all honesty, I avoided her. Years later, I ended up working in the patient advocate office where this woman came in frequently to see my coworker. I observed my coworker, listened to her carefully, make phone calls to help her, and even joke around with her. One day, the woman came in and I was the only one in the office. I tried, but I could not understand her. She pulled out an alphabet board and started pointing awkwardly to the letters. When I said the word out loud, she would yell, yeah, very approvingly, and we were on to the next word. She was very patient with me, and I felt my fear of failure start to ebb away. More importantly, I saw her as a person. So what short-term action can be done in a crisis that unveils years of inequity yet presents an acute need now? The mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, after seeing her city's statistics, insisted on collecting and reporting the data of COVID-19's impact on people of color. She mobilized a racial equity rapid response team to demystify the access to medical care and to help the sick get to a doctor. Recognizing social distancing as a privilege, response teams work to help households with multiple members brainstorm on how to keep those who are ill isolated in a room or in some other way separated from others. She increased the number of buses on busy routes to allow for additional distancing of people commuting by public transit. The mayor arranged for hospital workers to be put up in hotel rooms for respite, understanding that many of them commute great distances and are worried about infecting their loved ones at home. Mayor Lightfoot ordered that all providers do, doing testing must enter the race and ethnicity of the patients in their medical records to report as demographic data, both at the City of Chicago's website and also to the Center for Disease Control. As for institutional preparedness, such as hospitals, the Hastings Center, a bioethics research institute, issued guidelines for institutional ethics services responding to COVID-19. These guidelines include the duty to plan for foreseeable ethical challenges during a public health emergency, including planning for potential triage decisions, tools, and processes. The guidelines include the duty to safeguard workers and protect vulnerable populations with underlying health conditions and those confronting barriers to accessing health care. Finally, the duty to guide. A hospital's institutional ethics service and clinical ethics consultation should function as resources for clinicians experiencing uncertainty and distress. In addition to responding to the immediate crisis, there are longer range issues best viewed through the lens of public health and social determinants of health. These efforts need to include community members and stakeholders from diverse populations to give voice, energy, and insight into the issues at hand. Those of us in the current majority culture would do well to cultivate diverse friendships and listen to the stories of others. Be willing to accept correction, be intolerant of intolerance, look for ways to self-educate and have conversations in our communities. I believe there is hope for us as a society to come through this stronger and more compassionate. I've experienced and witnessed the kindness of those less vulnerable to COVID-19, making deliveries of food and medicine to those more susceptible or isolating at home. I've experienced grocery store staff finding lighthearted ways to remind shoppers of social distancing and to entertain those waiting in line. I have seen the chalk drawings of children in the streets and the signs in the windows reminding us to be kind. I've had more conversations with complete strangers that six months ago I would have walked by, but now notice a genuinely friendly exchange of, how are you doing? It can be a time of worry and blame, but it can also be a time of clarity and change. May we come through this together 
being more fully human than before and responding to the needs of our neighbor.